Welcome to Abergavenny Baptist Church. Life, faith, together. Well, the Bible reading today is from Galatians chapter 3 and verses 26 to 29. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, we continue in our series entitled The Big Story of the Bible, Finding Our Place Within God's Story. You see, the Bible tells one big unified story that finds its climax in Jesus. And so it's the story of God and it's the true story of the world. And I invite you to find your place within the story. And today we're still in Act 5, the story of the church, spreading the good news of the king. And today we, we're in scene four, a new family of God. You see, when you put your faith in Jesus, you become a child of God. God becomes your father and, and we become brothers and sisters. And this is what the church is. It's the family of God. Now, you will remember how God gave birth to the church when the Holy Spirit fell on a small gathering of Jewish believers and their hearts were set on fire and they boldly shared the good news, the, the, the gospel. And in a short space of time, the, the gospel spread like wildfire from Jerusalem all the way around the surrounding areas of Judea. But they were only sharing the gospel with fellow Jews. I mean, they were sharing the gospel to, to Jews from all over the place, but they were only sharing the gospel to fellow Jews. Which kind of makes sense, because ever since the time of Abraham, it, it's been the Jews who have been the family of God. It, the Jews who have been the renewed and restored humanity through which God is going to restore the whole cosmos. But what they failed to grasp was that God's plan had always been to bring all people together into a single family. The family of God. And that's how God is going to restore humanity through the church. And so in Acts chapter 10, God says to Peter, God tells Peter to go to a non-Jewish man's house, a guy by the name of Cornelius. But he's not just a non-Jew, he is a Roman centurion. He is the, the biggest enemy of the Jews. Peter goes to his house and while he's there, he explains the good news of the gospel to, to Cornelius and his household. And while he's explaining the gospel, the Holy Spirit comes upon Cornelius and his whole household. And, and Peter's amazed because God does not show favoritism, but accepts people from every nation. And so non-Jews start to be included into the family of God. In fact, a few chapters later in Acts chapter 11, uh, we discover that the church in Antioch, that's Paul's home church, in the church of Antioch, there actually ends up being more non-Jewish believers than Jewish believers. And this starts to cause a, a storm of controversy. We, we read in Acts chapter 15 and verses 1 to 2. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So there were these, these group of Jewish believers who were becoming furious that non-Jews were being accepted into the family of God without first becoming Jewish. And the way you would become Jewish was by obeying all the laws of Moses, the, the Ten Commandments and so on, but especially the law about circumcision. 
every male needed to be circumcised. Ouch. You see, for them, the equation of salvation was Jesus plus Jewish laws equals being saved, equals being part of the family of God. So they believed you needed faith in Jesus, but they also believed that you had to obey all the laws of Moses, especially the law about circumcision, in order to be saved, in order to be part of the family of God. Paul, however, was adamant that the equation of salvation was Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. And he was really passionate about this because he believed they were threatening the truth of the gospel. You see, they were actually saying that faith in Jesus is not enough. And so this led to a huge debate. And so a crisis meeting was held in Jerusalem, which was called the Council of Jerusalem. You can read about it in Acts chapter 15. So Paul and Barnabas, plus all the op their opposition, went to Jerusalem and met up with the 12 apostles. And they had a big debate and a long discussion. At the end, Peter stood up and he says in verse 10, Now then, why do you try to test God? By putting on the necks of the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews, a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. You see, there is no way you can make yourself right with God by obeying the law of Moses. And so Peter continues in verse 11, No, we believe that it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. You see, it's by grace we are saved. That means it's a free gift. There is absolutely nothing you need to do nor can do to earn this gift because it's a free gift. Jesus has already paid the price in full by dying for us on the cross. And so the equation is simply Jesus plus nothing equals salvation, being part of the family of God. And of course, this has a huge implication for the new family of God. The new family of God is not a single homogeneous family of ethnic Jews. No, the new family of God is a single family, but it's a single, worldwide, multicultural family that is made up of people from every nationality and every ethnic and social background. This is the church. And Paul really unpacks this in all his letters. In, in his letters, Paul always presents the church as the single worldwide multicultural family. The most famous one is probably in Galatians chapter 3 and verses 26 to 28, where Paul writes, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. The only way we become a child of God is through faith in Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or not. The only way we become a child is on the exact same terms, through faith in Jesus. And so Paul, uh, Peter, uh, sorry, no, Paul goes on, but notice the, the universal nature of this new family. He says, for all of you were who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And this is the church. The church is this single family, but it's a, a single multicultural worldwide family that is made up of people from every gender, every nationality, and every ethnic and social background, all gathering and worshiping together. It's a family where everyone is valued and respected and treated as an equal, treated as your very own brother and sister.
And it's this vision of the church that radically undermines any form of racism, sexism, classism, nationalism, or any other ism, for we are all one in Jesus. And therefore, we want to affirm that black lives do matter. Tom Wright, a, a New Testament scholar, tells a story about a time when he was sharing, uh, when he was uh, giving an academic lecture on this very passage about us all being one in Jesus. At the end, during a Q&A, another theologian, who happened to be a black lady, said, When you talk about us all being one in Jesus, what I hear, whether you mean it or not, is that you are welcoming us all to become honorary white middle class males. Ouch. But she's right. Isn't that exactly what we do? When we say, oh, we're going to accept everyone as, as one, what we actually are doing are inviting other people to become middle class whites, to, to, to become just like us. But that's not valuing them and respecting them for who they are in Jesus. I can remember when I was still a youth pastor in a church, in an inner city church in South Africa. And due to the fact that apartheid had come to an end, the inner city, which was all white, had now become predominantly black. But our church was still all white. Uh, and to our credit, we, we acknowledged this. And so we organized this big outreach mission in the local park. We, we set up this massive tent and we had this, this awesome, lively worship band that led us in these lively worship songs. We had this great drama team. We had these very dynamic, powerful preachers come and preach the gospel. And every night people came and people gave their lives to Jesus. And then they would invite their friends to come the next night and they would give their lives. At the end of the week, we said, we invited everyone to come to church. The next Sunday, the church was packed. And, and I can remember the, the, the pastor standing up at the front and saying, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service. Would you please turn to hymn number 342 in the red hymn book? And all the black folk were like looking at each other and going, Where's that awesome worship band? Where, where, where are the guitars? Where are the drums? And then the, uh, the, the pastor said, Why don't you take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 10? We're going to be working our way through the passage verse by verse. And all the black folk were looking at each other and going, What happened to all those dynamic uh, preachers? Oh, where are they gone? And you see, what we had actually done was that we had welcomed them all to become honorary, middle-class whites, uh, to, to become just like us. And so it wasn't very surprising that the next Sunday, most of them didn't come back. And I pray and hope that they would find another church. But if they did, they probably just went to a majority black church, which is just as bad as a majority white church. You see, neither a majority white church nor a majority black church is truly being the church. It's a distortion of the church. The church is a single, worldwide, multicultural family that is made up of people of every gender, nationality, and ethnic and social background, all worshipping together. And that means we don't just accept them, but we also accept and embrace their culture and customs as they embrace our culture and customs. And that's why we always try to have a blend of worship styles at our church. You see, not being a racist and, and not being a sexist, not being a classist, is not an optional extra. You know, rejecting racism and embracing diversity within the family of Jesus is not an additional rule that you may or may not obey. This is who we are. This is our calling. This is 
our vocation. This is the very essence of the gospel. You see, the gospel is all about, through faith in Jesus, being made right with God and with each other. It's about being welcomed into the family of God. And therefore, a, a racist Chris, Christian is an oxymoron. It's denying the very thing we are. And the church has always been the single, worldwide, multicultural family. Pliny the, the Younger, a, a Roman governor from the second century, early second century, uh, he writes about how, how the worst thing about Christianity is the mixing of, of different people groups. Uh, slaves and free people socializing together. Jews and Greeks, uh, sorry, Jews and Gentiles, Greeks and barbarians, slaves and free, men and women, children and adults, all mixing together and socializing together. This was the most off-putting thing. Society at large didn't like it because it was subversive. And even today, when the church is truly being the church, it is subversive. It challenges the status quo. And people don't like it. Why? Well, it's showing people a whole new way of being human. The way of Jesus. And it's a sign and a foretaste of God's new creation. This is how life will be when God renews the heavens and the earth. And so it challenges people. It threatens people. Because it challenges the way the world likes to organize human life. And sadly, too often the church has failed to live up to its calling. And as a result, we've left it uh, to liberal, the liberal secular world to achieve this multicultural society. Now, I don't know if you realize, but the liberal secular vision of a multicultural society is a Christian ideal. But it's a Christian ideal that is detached from its Christian roots. That's why it doesn't work. That's why there's still racism. You see, they're trying to achieve the fruits of the gospel, but detached from the roots of the gospel. They're trying to achieve a multicultural society, but without the gospel and the power of the Spirit. And so it lacks the power to transform people. You know, the best that they'll do is, is produce more rules, more legislation, don't be a racist. Don't discriminate. We don't need more rules. More rules are just going to make us feel guilty. What we need is a new heart. What we need is the gospel and the spirit. How does this transformation happen? Well, when we put our faith in Jesus, we receive a new identity. We become a new creation. We become a child of of God. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In other words, he has died to his old identities. And we need to die to our old identity. I need to die to, to trying to find my identity in being a white, middle class, South African male. And I need to find my identity in Jesus, in being a child of God. Now, of course, I, I'm still going to be a, a white, middle-class South African uh, male. But that's, that's not my primary identity. That's secondary. My primary identity is in Jesus. But my old identity still have some deep-seated beliefs in my heart. They still have some... I still have some deep-seated biases in my heart. And those need to be rooted out through repentance. You see, the, the church is a company of sinners who mutually forgive one another, 
and mutually receive forgiveness. More of that next time. I want to end today by telling you a story. It's a story I've shared before, but uh, it's so good. I'm, I'm going to share it again. It's a story about a guy called Clarence Jordan. And he was invited to preach in a Baptist church in the hills of South Carolina. And this is back in the 50s, where racial tension was rife. There was real animosity between blacks and whites within that area. So when Clarence arrived and he took to the platform, he was amazed to see that the congregation was completely integrated. Blacks and whites sitting together and worshipping together. So he asked the old hillbilly preacher who, who was the pastor there, how did this happen? How did you get to the church become like this? Like what? said the old hillbilly preacher. You, you, you know, all, all integrated, you know, blacks and whites all sitting together, worshipping together. Did it come about since the decision? What decision? The, the decision of the, of the Supreme Court when they, when, when they you know, say that all the schools need to be integrated and, and, and so on. What's the Supreme Court got to do with us? Said the old hillbilly preacher. Good point. But Clarence wasn't about to let him off the hook. And he said, come on, you must know you've got something unusual over here. With all blacks and whites all worshipping together, sitting together. How did that come about? Well, said the old hillbilly preacher. Our church, we only had about a handful of people left when our, our previous preacher died. And we couldn't get a new preacher no how. So I said to the church, I will be the preacher. And they agreed. And so on the first day I got up into the pulpit, I opened up my Bible, put my finger down, and it landed on Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, which says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And I said, in Christ Jesus, in Jesus, there's no place for racism. After the service, the deacons took me into the back room and sat me down and said, we don't want that type of preaching here no more. So Clarence asked, well, well, what happened then? I fired them deacons, said the old hillbilly preacher. How come they didn't fire you? They didn't hire me. And that's one of the advantages of being an unprayed preacher. And then Clarence said, Soon as I, I'm sorry, not Clarence, the old hillbilly preacher said, soon as I found out what was bothering them, I preached that every Sunday. I preached that church down to five people. But then some new people started joining. And then more and more black people, white people, all worshipping together. And I said to them, when you filled with Jesus, all that r racist garbage gets washed away. That night, Clarence was driven back to his hotel by a very sophisticated young English professor from the, the University of South Carolina. This guy drove 70 miles each way just to hear that old guy preach, to attend that church. So Clarence asked him, well, why do you drive all this way to, to this old church? I mean, that old hillbilly preacher can't even utter a single sentence without making a grammatical error. Why would you go all that way to hear him speak? And the young English professor said, I go to that church because that man preaches the gospel. And that church is truly being the church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you that we can be your children, that you invite us into your family, that worldwide, multicultural family, that single family of God. And Father, we want to ask for forgiveness when we have not lived up to our calling, when we have half-heartedly accepted people, but basically on the terms that they become like us, that they follow our customs, our culture, 
our style of worship, our way of dress, that they behave like us, act like us, like what we like. Father, please forgive us for it. Father, we pray that you would root out any deep-seated biases and prejudices that we might have in our hearts. We pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would give us your love and compassion for all people, and that you would empower us and enable us to truly be your church, to love one another, to forgive one another, and to be one in your Spirit. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching. For more information, please visit our website at abergavennybaptist.co.uk.